Hi, I'm Jill Weber. I'm a research associate with the Sims Initiatives, a digital humanities project of the University Libraries, which is funded in part with a generous grant from the Watson Brown Foundation. In celebration of Halloween and to promote our site, we're reading one of Sims's ghost stories throughout the month of October. The story is called Grey Lane, or Murder Will Out, and is part of the author's short story collection, The Wigwam and the Cabin. At the point in the story where we last left off, James Grayling had just been visited by the ghost of Major Spencer and has dashed to the docks of Charleston to try to apprehend the murderous McNabb before he flees to England. The chase continues in part 13 of William Gilmore Sims's Grayling, or Murder Will Out. <clears throat> James Grayling, with the same eager impatience which he has been suffered to describe in his own language, had already hired a boat to go on board the British packet when he remembered that he had neglected all those means, legal and otherwise, by which alone his purpose might be properly effected. He did not know much about legal processes, but he had common sense enough, the moment that he began to reflect on the subject, to know that some such process was necessary. This conviction produced another difficulty. He knew not in which quarter, <clears throat> which quarter to turn for counsel and assistance, but here the boatman who saw his bewilderment and knew by his dialect and dress that he was a back countryman came to his relief and from him he got directions where to find the merchants with whom his uncle, Sparkman, had done business in former years. To them he went and without circumlocution told the whole story of his ghostly visitation. Even as a dream, with which these gentlemen at once conjectured it to be, the story of James Grayling was equally clear and curious, and his intense warmth and the entire absorption which the subject had affected of his mind and soul was such that they judged it not improper at least to carry out the search of the vessel which he had contemplated. It would certainly, they thought, be a curious coincidence, believing James to be a voracious youth, if the Scotchman should be found on board. But another test of his narrative was proposed by one of the firm. It so happened that the business agents of Major Spencer, who is well known in Charleston, kept their office but a few rods distant from their own, and to them all parties at once proceeded. But here the story of James was encountered by a circumstance that made somewhat against it. These gentlemen produced a letter from Major Spencer intimating the utter impossibility of his coming to town for the space of a month and expressing his regret that he should be unable to avail himself of the opportunity of the foreign vessel, of whose arrival in Charleston and proposed time of departure they had themselves advised him. They read the letter aloud to James and their brother merchants and with difficulty suppressed their smiles at the gravity with which the former related and insisted upon the particulars of his vision. He has changed his mind, returned the impetuous youth. He was on his way down, I tell you, a hundred miles on his way when he camped with us. I know him well, I tell you, and I talked with him myself half the night. At least, remarked the gentleman who had gone with James, it can do no harm to look into the business. We can procure a warrant for searching the vessel after this man, McNabb, and should he be found on board the packet, it will be a sufficient circumstance to justify the magistrates in detaining him until we can ascertain where Major Spencer really is. <clears throat> this has been part 13 of William Gilmore Sims's Grey Lane, or Murder Will Out. I hope you tune in next time for another section of this ghostly tale. If you'd like to read the full text of the story or any of the other works we have available, simply visit the Sims Initiative's website at sims.library.sc.edu. Until then, happy Halloween.